Hey, really excited to be here today. I'm Todd Mostak, uh, co-founder and CEO of MapD Technologies. Uh, excited to tell you a little bit about why GPUs are going to disrupt um, analytics in general and data visualization specifically. Uh, so you're going to hear a lot about GPUs today. Uh, our friends at Kinetica are going to appear in a few hours. Uh, so hopefully you'll leave with a, a little bit more of an understanding of why uh, GPUs make so much sense for uh, the analytics space. So everybody has seen you know, slides like this, right? Um, we're faced with this deluge of data. Uh, data is uh, growing at a tremendous rate. Organizations are struggling with how to grapple with the deluge of data that they're facing. So if you look at you know, whether it's uh, traditional enterprise sources of data, uh, whether it's social media or web data, clickstream data, whether it's data that would broadly fall under the rubric of IoT, uh, i.e. sensors and devices, data coming off of mobile phones, uh, cars, industrial automation, smart homes, et cetera. Uh, we're looking at this huge year-over-year -year growth rate. So they're saying that uh, basically data size doubles uh, in less than three years. And so storage is not the issue, um, but the ability of a CPU to process that data is actually uh, a major problem. So if CPUs are growing at maybe a 20% you know, year-over-year rate, uh, GPU, uh, GPUs are actually getting faster at a 40% year over year clip. So just to take a step back a little bit and think about what is a GPU. So I'm sure some of you are familiar with playing um, 3D video games, uh, whether it's Quake, whether it's racing games, whatever you have it. And GPUs have originally evolved to actually render graphics to a screen. Uh, so basically uh, they could, people realized that you could actually compute the color of each pixel independently and in parallel. And uh, so they started adding more and more cores uh, to these devices to actually render data. And then at some point, people, smart people, realized that you could actually do a lot more than graphics computation with these devices. And so people started putting all sorts of, um, you know, shoehorning all sorts of stuff into the graphics API, uh, running scientific simulations, uh, different HPC workloads, and thing like, things like this. And then NVIDIA, um, roughly 10 years ago, had the foresight to to make a general purpose programming language called CUDA. And that was shortly followed by another language called OpenCL, which allowed general purpose compute on these devices. And so fast forward to today, and you see all sorts of workloads being ported to GPUs. Uh, so uh, of course, you have the standard kind of HPC scientific simulation workloads. You also have uh, machine lear learning workloads. So everyone is probably familiar with the whole deep learning revolution, um, putting neural nets or artificial neural nets um, programming these, and they're, they're really, really um, incredible, uh, you know, basically algorithms for all sorts of, all sorts of classification tasks and other tasks. And then finally, you're seeing general analytics being pushed to GPUs. So, um, you know, our company, Kinetica and others, are actually pushing, uh, pushing these computations onto the chip, running SQL, doing visualization, doing kind of the full stack, and actually pushing it to the graphics cards. And the reason why we're doing that is if you look here, you know, if you look at the relatively tepid growth in CPU processing power, um, so we're gradually getting faster. If you're lucky, you might see a 10 or 20 percent year-over-year growth in CPU processing power, whether you measure that by their compute bandwidth or by their memory bandwidth. Uh, GPUs, on the other hand, uh, have seen uh, a much more prodigious growth, both in compute bandwidth, uh, to the extent that today you can actually get a single 4U server that has almost 100 teraflops of compute performance uh, in, in a 4U box. Um, and that's pretty amazing. That's effectively a, a supercomputer. It would have been a top 10 supercomputer five or 10 years ago. Um, and that means you can do 100 trillion floating point operations per second. Um, memory bandwidth is another big key piece of the story. So when you're doing analytics, um, when you're doing analytics, basically you're often limited by how fast you can actually scan the data. So the GPUs have much higher memory bandwidth. They typically leverage the fastest memory technologies available. And that means that you can actually um, run SQL queries, for example, ac across huge amounts of data in interactive timeframes. So you can do a, a scan of a, a multi-billion row data set in, in mere milliseconds. So just another way of looking at it. If you had a, um, you know, a CPU system, you might have 10, 20, 24 cores. A GPU server, and this is actually not to scale, you would need six, uh, 24 of these screens to actually show the number of cores 
you might have 40,000 cores. So imagine being able to process 40,000 things in parallel. Uh, that's effectively what GPU compute gives you. Um, and it kind of changes the paradigm with what you can actually do at kind of interactive speeds or in real time. So this is where MathD comes in. So MathD actually came out of my research at MIT and the MIT database group uh, under Mike Stonebreaker and Sam Madden. Uh, MathD was built from the ground up to leverage the massive parallels that I've been talking about in these GPUs to deliver orders of magnitude speed ups over these CPU solutions. So effectively, we're riding on this kind of supercomputing super computing level of power that these GPUs have and using them to do A, in MathD core, it's a, a super fast SQL database that actually uses multiple GPUs per server. Um, and basically, we can process um, you know, multi billion row data sets and run analytic queries over these data sets literally in tens of milliseconds. And so it kind of opens up the door with what you can do interactively and particularly for interactive visualization, right? So um, one of the real sweet spots or killer apps for having such speed is actually being able to slice and dice this data in real time. Uh, so it was a natural fit to take the processing capabilities of MapD Core and leverage them in a purpose-built web front end called MapD Immerse, uh, which not only leverages the speed of our back end, but actually leverages something very cool about the GPUs, which is their ability to actually render uh, data natively. So the GPUs, of course, were originally built to process graphics, and so we can use them not only for the SQL, but we, when it makes sense, we can actually render the, the result sets um, on the server, actually on the chip, without even taking the data off the chip. And I'll, I'll demo that for you shortly. So where does MathD sit in the overall ecosystem? Uh, so sometimes we're a replacement for your data warehouse. We have pure SQL use cases. Uh, in different places, we've displaced Vertica, um, other systems that you might see here on the left. Often we're sitting kind of alongside these systems, offloading high value use cases that need real time analytics. So the data at rest may be in Hadoop, it may be in Teradata, it may be in SQL Server, uh, and we have nice connectivity where we can actually pull data out of these systems. Alternatively, we can pull in streaming data via Kafka, and once it's in the system, it's going to be ultra fast. So MapD is you know, a full database at its heart. And so we're actually uh, bringing that data onto GPUs, allowing real-time compute. People can actually leverage uh, things like Tableau, third-party viz tools. Uh, they can leverage us programmatically, imagine fraud detection in real-time. And then, of course, one of the sweet spots is actually leveraging our speed through MapD Immerse, which is the front end that was built to work hand-in-glove with our, our back end. So the focus of this talk is actually on viz, but I think it's important for me to set the stage a little bit and tell you about MapD Core, which is what makes all of this possible uh, just by its very, very high performance uh, that it enables. Um, so again, MapD Core is this database that runs on GPUs. It's SQL, uh, analytic SQL database. So one of our core innovations, which other people in the space hadn't considered, was actually being able to cache the data on the GPU. So you can think about it, you're on a server. Um, GPU servers often have many, many GPUs uh, per actual box or per server. Uh, in fact, you can actually go to Amazon today and get a 16 GPU server and spin it up by the hour. Uh, so the first realization was that, hey, we have a lot of GPUs. Each has um, some amount of ultra-fast video RAM on board. Let's see how much of the data that we can actually cache uh, on the GPU itself. So if you think of a CPU, I'm not sure how familiar you are with uh, kind of CPU architectures, but typically there's different levels of cache. There's an L1 cache, an L2 cache, an L3 cache. You can think of GPU RAM as our L1 cache. So the system intelligently and behind the scenes without the user needing to kind of explicitly um, program it to do so, will cache the hottest data in compressed form in the GPU RAM itself across these multiple GPUs. Um, so we do all the kind of buffer management of that and you can fit a surprising amount of data. You can actually get specialized boxes that have 384 gigabytes of video RAM. Um, one of these Amazon box might have 192 gigabytes. And because we're compressing the data, because we're a column store uh, where we don't have to have all the columns in video RAM, because we don't have to have every partition um, in video RAM, we can fit a surprising amount of data um, in VRAM. So some of our customers routinely run five to 10 billion records on a single server with response times in the tens of milliseconds across data, that, data sets of that size before needing to basically scale out. 
Um, so the nice thing, though, is that if it doesn't all fit in GPU RAM, it's not game over. We actually use the CPU RAM of the system, which is typically much bigger, even though that CPU RAM is perhaps a little bit slower, or significantly slower, I should say. Uh, and we actually use that as our L2 cache. And then what doesn't fit there will actually spill into SSD or NVRAM, some fast uh, disk layer. Um, and so effectively, we handle all that buffering for the user, and uh, the system just kind of kind of works and keeps the data's uh, the user's workloads very very fast. Um, another thing that we do, um, because we wanted to be the fastest kind of analytics database in the world, um, we actually built a query compilation engine uh, using uh, something called LLVM. So traditional databases actually um, interpret their queries. They'll basically go through, they'll parse a SQL query, reduce it to kind of a relational algebra tree, and then um, actually kind of walk the tree and execute each node um, one step at a time, and typically pass the tuples uh, through iterators um, up through the tree. Um, it's a very powerful approach, but it's also very inefficient in the sense that you have all this overhead of passing the data between these iterators, and it just happens to not parallelize very well. Um, obviously, if you're running on GPUs, you need things that can parallelize well. You have these thousands of cores. You need to make sure that you can actually use them. Um, so we built a custom compilation engine that takes the SQL and actually um, compiles it to either GPU or CPU machine code. Um, and we can use something called LLVM, which is a very cool um, technology, an Apple-backed open source compiler technology that allows us to, we generate this uh, intermediate code in LLVM. We can target GPUs. We can target CPUs. It gives us flexibility to basically execute on whatever hardware the user has. Um, and it's quite, uh, you know, quite powerful, and it ends up with queries that run basically as fast as you could write something with a custom GPU function or something that you wrote in C by hand. And the kind of result of this is, you know, when I said earlier kind of the fastest analytics database, I'm not saying that with hyperbole. Um, we've been benchmarked independently and routinely we've come up as the kind of the top fastest database um, in, this, in this guy's benchmark. He's benchmarked all sorts of systems. And uh, you see that some of these queries over this 1.1 billion record taxi data set were running in 20 milliseconds or so. And so you get down to Spark that's taking 10 seconds, even though it's running on 10 nodes. We're running on a single, single node with eight gamer GPUs here. Um, and we're about to do some big multi-node uh, benchmarks on it, where it's almost that the data set is too small to actually see the full benefit of MapD. But you can imagine this scaling to data sets with 100 plus billion rows, allowing for real-time analytics and visualization. So obviously we don't just focus on speed for the sake of speed itself, right? It's like what is the use case um, for being so blindingly fast? Uh, one of the major use cases and something I'm gonna focus on in this talk is Immerse, um, basically our, our custom web front end that allows for lightning fast visual analytics across massive data sets. Um, so it works again hand in glove uh, with MapD Core um, and it does some very cool things. Um, so some of the things may look familiar. Um, we actually, when it makes sense, uh, imagine you're grouping by U.S. state, you're grouping by um, U.S. airline carrier, you have result sets that are pretty small. We'll run that SQL query on our fast back end, but there's no reason why we can't render that in the front end with D3, and that's exactly what we do. Uh, we bring it to the client and we render it in the client uh, with standard kind of D3 charts. Um, but the cool thing is actually when it makes sense, when you have large result sets, uh, imagine you're trying to visualize every tweet on a map, every call data record on a map, um, data on a scatter plot, uh, you know, every census block, for example. It often tends to be very, uh, you know, geo-focused, but it does not, doesn't have to be. Uh, we can actually render that right on the chip itself. So not only will we run the SQL query on the GPU, but without copying the result or even moving it to CPU, uh, we'll actually just feed it straight from the, the CUDA, which is the compute pipeline, into the OpenGL visualization pipeline and render it in situ and deliver back a compressed PNG to the client um, that instead of you know, tens or hundreds of gigabytes might weigh in at 100 kilobytes. Um, so it allows for interactive visualization at scale in a way that um, a typical system, a BI system like Tableau running on top of a server like Vertica, as great as those products are, would never uh, allow you to do. And then we can do things like composite um, GeoViz um, kind of on a, on a map. Um, and the, the, the central paradigm that's on the slide of all of this is a cross-filter model. 
So some of you may have heard of things like crossfilter.js and dc.js. So we actually took those libraries and kind of gutted them and made them hit our back end and issue SQL. And then we built this app in React on top of it, um, which allows for kind of WYSIWYG, uh, you know, design of dashboards on top. But it's all based on the crossfilter model, whereas I click on something, it cross filters. And that really showcases and harnesses the speed of our back end. So this is a little bit more about server-side rendering. Um, it's a very popular feature of MapD. Um, again, it, you know, we can significantly compress the data that we're sending from server to client. It allows granular visualization at scale. And we use something called Vega, which is an open source specification from the University of Washington. Um, Vega is basically a, a spec that allows us to define a mapping from data to actually visualization. So we can say that, hey, we're going to make, um, you know, uh, we're going to make the size of this point on a point map correspond to the amount of dollars that were donated to a particular political party, and then we can set D3-like scales on that. And so there's an API for, for doing that. And then on the back end, just like we compile our SQL queries, we actually compile uh, shaders on the fly. So we're actually generating these OpenGL shaders to do the rendering um, on, the, on the fly, just like we do queries. Another cool thing about it is that um, we wanted to make the experience feel like the data is completely in the front end, even if we're rendering a static PNG, uh, and we can do that in you know, tens of milliseconds and bring that to the client. We still wanted to allow the user to have full mouse over interactivity with the actual uh, data that they're interfacing with, that's this actual PNG. So you'll find, and I'll demo this for you shortly, but as the user mouses over any of the points, they actually get the metadata associated with it. And they can do that because we can actually do this hit testing on the back end. Um, and actually see what's under the point in, in near constant time. Um, so when we're rendering the data, we actually render the, the row ID that actually uh, ends up on top, and that allows us to uh, actually see what's being, um, what's, what's under the user's mouse. All right, so enough talking. I'm actually going to cut to a, a demo here. I'm going to cut to a few things. Uh, uh, so the first is, this is a relatively small data set for us. This is about 400 million rows. Um, this is actually uh, a partner of ours. Uh, we do a lot of work in the telco space, and uh, both the telco and carrier space. One of our big clients is Verizon uh, Wireless. Uh, this is actually not Verizon's uh, data, um, but this is data from a partner of ours called Tutela that actually collects kind of metrics and quality of service data from, uh, from apps. And it's very useful for carriers to actually pinpoint you know, where there's high latency, um, where they need to add more cell towers, uh, things like this. Um, so if you actually look at here, the first thing you'll notice is that you're looking at this map. And here we can actually see um, the latency average by location. So yellow is higher. Um, we can see the number of records by carrier, color by latency. We're actually looking at Turkey. Most of this data happens to be um, focused on Turkey for whatever reason. So this is actually Istanbul. Uh, latency average by signal strength. So you can see a signal strength gets better, latency gets lower. Uh, latency by carrier and um, you know, by time of day. So if I zoom in here, um, you can actually see everything kind of interactively update. And we're actually querying this data set real time and on the fly. Um, and it's none of this stuff is pre-canned or pre-calculated. We're basically using the brute force capabilities of the GPUs to scan this data set many times over. So each of these um, charts is actually issuing its own SQL query to our back end, um, which, which is responding in milliseconds, even though we didn't index or do anything with the data, we just, we just loaded it. Um, so here you can see some interesting stuff. You can actually see that the roads tend to have higher latency. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, we could even you know, lasso one of the roads if we wanted to. And we could actually look at it's a pretty poor lasso, but uh, we can actually look at a specific road segment. We're doing this geospatial query, which is quite complicated, um, again, again on the fly. So just to illustrate a use case that somebody like Verizon might have, um, imagine you're looking at this data, and the first thing you notice is that, hey, there's actually a spike in latency um, at this time. So I might brush that. And here we see that um, you know, it actually ends up being, you can't really see it because my screen is kind of squished here, but it's actually Avia, which is a carrier. So if I was this carrier or one of their competitors, I might be wanting to see, like, why is this actually happening? Because, of course, for a telco, um, if you have drop calls or high latency, people might go to a competitor. Um, 
so here I can actually see this in granular detail. It really doesn't still show me much about why this might be occurring. Um, but one of the things I could actually do here is um, I'm going to add another chart. I'm going to add uh, CID, which is actually the cell tower ID. I'm going to add latency here and apply it. And here we can see immediately that there's an offending tower. Um, and I can actually invert click that and you'll see that the latency drops out. So basically I filtered that data out. I could also filter it in. Um, and you see that it's actually only 32 records. So there's nothing really systematic here. There's probably some cell tower that had some brief issue, software, hardware issue. Um, and it's not a larger system, systemic issue with the network. Um, but this is something our clients use this for, for kind of real time um, analytics. And the great thing is, you know, not only is it this very fast viz system, but they can actually go in and it's a SQL database under the hood so they can start issuing queries um, on the front end or back end. Um, and they have that full capability as well. Um, this is a fun data set. I'm not going to dive too much into this. Uh, this is uh, New York City taxi data. Um, you know, what I was telling you about is that you can actually hover over anything and get the associated metadata. We're doing that through this hit testing functionality um, I was telling you about. Um, you know, we can zoom in here. We can get very granular. Um, and we can actually see that, for example, as I um, brush over here, this is 1.2 billion records, by the way, single server. Um, as I brush over here, this, this area actually drops out. Um, and that's because they knocked down the uh, Pan Am terminal. Um, and again, I could just, if I wanted to, I could just highlight it. And uh, we could actually see this area drop off the map when they knock down that, that terminal area. So uh, one last demo. Uh, this is, Matt, you recently introduced uh, uh, distributed functionality, native distributed scale out functionality. This is actually us scaling to four, uh, four Amazon servers with eight GPUs each. This is 11.5 billion records. Uh, this is ship AIS data. Um, so it's pretty amazing that we can, shouldn't say amazing, but impressive, I guess, from a, if you're an analytics person, that we can actually do this in real time. Um, so for example, I could zoom in here to um, uh, basically to the Louisiana area. We could look at different kind of ships by their ship length. We can see that the larger ships are kind of tankers and you know the shorter ships maybe tugboats and things like that. Um, we could even go in here and if I zoom in on this time frame, if you guys remember there was the uh, kind of deep water horizon uh, spill and this is all the uh, this is all the cleanup associated with that. You see like anti-pollution boats crisscrossing the area um, and so we can actually do that in, in real time. Um, 10 minutes, okay, great. So yeah, it gives you some, capa some idea of the capabilities of the system. Um, you know, again, we're not necessarily built to replace a traditional BI product. In fact, uh, we have a lot of people using Tableau on top of our system. Um, if you need pixel perfect kind of reporting, um, use Tableau. Uh, our system, or at least the Immerse component, was actually uh, built for kind of interactive data discovery, data exploration. And we think that it, it fills a need in the market. Uh, people are grappling with much bigger data sets, some geospatial, some not. Uh, that they need to be able to analyze and um, explore in real time. And, you know, that's, that's very underserved by traditional solutions, right? Um, traditional BI tools can't handle this size of data. Uh, they can't query it in real time. They can't render it in real time. And, um, you know, MapD has, a, I think, a, a very uh, cool role to play, uh, play in that regard. And, you know, another portion of our market is, is very much pure database stuff. Uh, which is also exciting doing kind of real-time fraud detection and things like this. But, uh, you know, excited to show you a little bit about Immerse today. So, happy to take any questions. Hey, quick, quick question about uh, the SQL support. So which subset of SQL do you support? So joins, subqueries, uh, that sort of stuff, or is it the more basic subset? Yeah, so it's uh, a great question. So we support um, most of SQL 92. So all the joins and subqueries, um, that kind of standard stuff, the date operators, uh, things like that. Things that will basically make any standard BI platform uh, run effectively. 
Um, we support, I mean, obviously we have a pretty aggressive roadmap of pushing into kind of the SQL 99 territory, uh, things like window functions uh, like this. Um, you know, we're growing by the day. I mean, one of our focuses has been, you know, not focused on checking boxes um, and functionality at the expense of speed. So our differentiator is that, you know, we're very, very fast, much faster than any other solution on the market. And so it's important that each of these kind of things, particularly when you're running on, you know, multiple GPUs, there's a lot of optimization work that we focus on. Um, so we focus on performance before we just add functionality, but we're, we're getting there. So we'll get to a SQL 99 solution probably within the next year. Hi, um, how closely coupled is the front end um, tool to the MapD core? And do you envision a future where you can use it with other non MapD backends? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, when we were originally um, getting Immerse working, I think the first backend we hit was Postgres. Um, we've kind of lost that functionality over time. So uh, we have been asked for it. It's not a current focus simply because we feel that um, this kind of interactive cross filtering benefits best from a you know, very, very fast backend. That if you were to do something like this on a, on a slower database, you just wouldn't have that kind of interactivity. You also wouldn't have these rendering capabilities, right? So um, we are um, you know, focused on the tight coupling, but perhaps in the future we would open it up to hit other, other backends. Um, well, I have you, I forgot to mention that there is an API that a lot of people actually build custom apps on, uh, on MapD. This is our tweet map, which is very popular. It's a streaming tweet map, the last 400 million geocoded tweets. Um, so there's a way to actually build custom apps below the um, uh, immerse layer here. So I could type in PlotCon. We could actually see what people are saying here at the conference. Um, you might see yourselves up there. Um, so you can actually build custom apps, but right now we do not hit other, other backends. How do I, you asked how do we know that the data is in real time? Oh, okay, so that's actually a, a UI thing. Um, so right now, actually, if I was to tweet, I'm not gonna try to do a, a real time tweet, but we'd actually, you know, you would see the point pop up. We don't have, we've thought about in our UI having queues where you could actually see data streaming. Right now it's on kind of a polling thing, so. Um, you could eventually imagine like having a streaming layer that would actually show the data come in, but I promise you, and you're welcome to test, you have to turn your geocoding on, uh, on Twitter, explicit geocoding. Um, it will pop up on, on this map. So, you know, witness the, uh, the plot con tweets from today's event. Yeah, hi. Impressive stuff. I was wondering what kind of backend spatial operations you support. One of the reasons we're, we're still on Postgres <laughs> is uh, it's kind of rich set of spatial operators. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. So I, uh, I'm a big fan of PostGIS. Uh, in fact, um, not to go too far back, but that was one of the impetuses to build MapD, my own kind of painful experiences of trying to run geospatial queries on Postgres, which is awesome and has the whole suite of functionality but can be very, very slow. Um, we don't have, we have very minimal operators. Obviously we can do the kind of point and polygon stuff that I was showing. Uh, we're adding support for native geospatial types. Um, so I think that will be a big thing right now. We're shoehorning it into things like, you know, floats, um, which obviously is not a, uh, you know, is not the right, right way forward if you actually want to start building up the full kind of, um, what do they call the, the API, but effectively the PostGIS API. So um, yes, there's a lot of demand for that. Um, one of our big customers, uh, Inkutel is, is an investor and, um, a federal government agency that does a lot of geospatial support. So you can imagine that they're looking for the, the same sort of thing. So near term roadmap. Over here. Yeah. Oh, this way. Hey. Hey. Uh, at what point do you see diminishing returns in terms of like number of rows? Because um, this is probably like really good for big data sets, but I imagine at some scale, at some smaller scale, it's somewhat equivalent to other. Um. Yes and no. So we actually have quite a few customers. We actually have a new customer that uh, um, a small real estate company that has 800,000 rows, I think maybe 1.2 million. And we said, well, that's pretty tiny. 
But then they said that, you know, um, two things. A, um, you know, the kind of cross-filter model UI is really nice. It's not something that you can easily get out of even something like Tableau. B, the rendering capabilities. Um, even that much data, being able to do a scatter plot or something and see all the data and not just see some sample was very valuable for them. Uh, so people do push down into, you know, we generally say our sweet spot's 100 million rows and up, but we have plenty of clients going um, significantly below that and finding a lot of value. The other thing about it is that you can run on minimal hardware, like, right, so, you know, if you want to run 100 million rows, you can actually run that on a single GPU. Uh, you could run that on a one or 1K or $500 gamer GPU on your, on your workstation. And so not having to provision, you know, you know, multiple servers of a CPU server, I think it's very, uh, is, is very valuable to people. But we definitely have a sweet spot. I would say, you know, 100 million rows on up, but I think you can find value at us at much lower scales, particularly with the, the rendering capabilities. So. I don't know, who's next? <laughs> Go ahead, since. Is a single server limited by the amount of memory? Nothing is limited per se. So the t system intelligently kind of caches and buffers things. And so if the data set goes, uh, the data set will always almost go bigger than GPU memory, but of course we're compressing and putting the hot data in. The performance is best, you know, if you can fit, if the kind of compressed hot data actually is fitting in GPU RAM, and so you don't have to move data from between CPU and GPU if we can effectively cache. But the system keeps working even if you go much bigger. Um, that is kind of the limit, and then you have the, you, you can scale out to multiple servers. But again, you know, um, you could easily, um, this 11 billion record demo, we're actually using the, um, the smaller Amazon servers. So you could do this in two of their big servers. Um, so that's pretty significant capability in a relatively small footprint, and that's actually one of our kind of value props for customers. Yeah, that's um, super impressive. Uh, I, clearly, you showed that you could scale to a lot of data. Um, does it also scale horizontally in the sense when you have a lot of users hitting the database? Yeah, actually, and that's, uh, it's interesting you bring that up. So um, the great thing is that because we're um, so fast on a single query, um, basically we can scale to, to many, many users. So our demos, particularly the TweetMap demo, is routinely getting, you know, there could be at least 10, 20 people on it at a time. That may not sound like a lot, but if you look at traditional BI systems, things often kind of fall apart when you have five or 10 users hitting, say, a Vertica to do their BI queries to power Tableau. Um, things often kind of grind to a halt, and you know, there's not much parallelism there. So we can actually get a little bit of parallelism running queries at the same time. We can do some pipelining between CPU and GPU operations. But the main way is just that the, the queries are so blindingly fast, they run in 20 milliseconds, that means that you could easily have 20, 50 users on a single server at a time with uh, very little uh, latency, extra latency. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you.